Okay, here we go. So welcome. This is, uh, which screen am I recording? That's a really good question. Um, Let's see your Drupal groups, your GDL page. Yeah, I want to make sure I am. Um... And it does say recording in the top corner. Yeah, it must be that one, right? Yeah, because that's the one I'm sharing. So that has to be on recording. Okay, never mind. Duh. I, it's not like I use Zoom every day, so, which I do. All right, anyway, hey, um, welcome to Florida Drupal Virtual Meetup number six, Composer Basics, and maybe some Q&A towards the end. So what I'm going to do is I have been working on writing a full day Composer workshop. Um, I, I just about have the full day. I've been, re I've been giving the half day version of this workshop for the past four or five months. I'm actually giving it um, next week at Cornell Drupal Camp and then the week after that at Bad Camp, the half day version. Um, so what I'm going to present tonight is kind of like the introduction to that, which is kind of the, um, the case for why we care about Composer, why we actually need it, um, as well as a actual non-Drupal Composer example that really shows kind of the foundation of what Composer is. So that is the plan. So as always, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions or put it in the Zoom chat. Um, and I will answer questions as I see as I see them. All right, so here we go. Oops, there we go. Compose them and present. All right, compose your basics. Um, and really, this you know, core skills for a professional. Maybe I should have professional PHP web developer, because these days, if you are developing any um, uh, any type of PHP application you probably should be using Composer to manage the code base. It has become the de facto standard for PHP projects for dependency management. And I think um, as we uh, go forward in the next few slides, you'll see why. So this is me. Uh, okay, good. All right, so first of all, let's define like what the heck a dependency manager is and why we care about it in the first place. So let's assume we have a project, we call it my project. Um, and, you know, PHP is open source and Drupal is open source and we all kind of live and work in an open source world. Um, and the idea is that there is a lot of code out there that is solid, that other people have written, that other people and communities maintain. So we want to avoid writing code as much as possible. We want to leverage open source code as much as possible. So we have to sit down and write a, a, an application that does something. Um, rather than sitting down with a blank, you know, a blank notepad plus plus or blank PHP storm or whatever, um, and just start writing everything we need, it, it you know, makes sense to kind of figure out what are the components, like what are the pieces that we need? What are the things, that, you know, the, the, the small chunks that our application has to do? Let's figure out what those are and figure out if that code already exists. So if we imagine that our project, among other things, it needs to do two things. It needs to send HTML email, and it needs to parse and write out YAML files. Now, we could write custom PHP code that does both of those things. I mean, there's plenty of mail functions in the PHP um, uh, function space um, that we can go through all that documentation and we can write some low level stuff to you know, send out HTML emails using just kind of raw PHP code. Same thing for YAML files and, you know, reading in YAML files. There are plenty of PHP file readers. There are plenty of ways to parse text and, and output text um, um, in, in YAML format and then read YAML format and, you know, convert it maybe into like a PHP object or something like that. So we could do all that ourselves, but why would we, right? If that code is already exists, it's vetted, it's tested, maybe it provides more functionality than um, we need at this moment, but it's there, it's solid, you know, in some cases, millions of people are already using it. Why wouldn't we reuse that code? So in the days before Dependency Manager, before Composer, we could like go to, I guess back in the day, it would be um, uh, uh, SourceForge, and we can download code from SourceForge and throw it in our project directory and include the right files and make that all happen. Um, and that that's basically, you know, the way things were for a long time. That's what Drupal 7 did with, um, like, jQuery. 
you know, there was no automated way that the community added jQuery or someone had to go and download jQuery version, whatever, and commit it to the repo. And that's how we got jQuery. Um, but Composer kind of is, 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 the, is the next level of that kind of manual process. So why is it so important? Why don't we just do it manually? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Reason number one is um, the maintainers of these other bits of code out there, and you know, let's refer to them as either dependencies or classes or packages. For the sake of this discussion, those are all pretty much the same, the same word. Um, they're all synonyms. Um, but the maintainers of Swift Mailer, they don't care about our project. They don't care about the schedule of our project. They don't care about when version 1.0.0 is coming out. Um, the Swift Mailer folks are on their own schedule. So they're going to release updates to Swift Mailer whenever they want. Um, and while a maintenance release, you know, from 5.4.12 to 5.4.13 may not, you know, break our site, a major version release might change the API and that might break our code. So we would want to be aware that, you know, Swift Mailer is moving from version five to version six. And maybe our code version 1.1.0.0 of our project works with 5.4.12 and we don't want to move off that. We, you know, we don't want to upgrade to version six because, you know, that might break our code. Um, so, you know, consider that case for every component. Our code, our project is going to be written for, for specific versions, or usually more accurately, specific ranges of versions. So maybe our my project works for Swift Mailer, any any you know five dot x, anything in the in the major five branch that works with. Um, so we need some way to keep track of that. That's the key there. Um, and then the other thing is those other packages or dependencies or libraries or classes might have dependence of their own, right? So the maintainers of YAML component, um, they actually use another component called polyfill C type. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's another open source project. Uh, it lives on GitHub. It has its own cadence, you know, releases and it, it does whatever it does. I actually have no idea what it does. Um, but the YAML component relies on polyfill C type. So if our project relies on the YAML component, it relies on a specific version of YAML component and the YAML component, component relies on a specific version of polyfill C type, um, then we have to make sure that all that stuff kind of stays, you know, synced up. Um, and this is, you know, a relatively simple project with two dependencies, but each of those dependencies can have dependencies. And each of those dependencies can have dependencies. So this dependency rabbit hole can, can get pretty deep pretty fast. So with, you know, a couple of dependencies, could we do it manually? I suppose, would we want to? Probably not. Um, the more dependencies we have, the trickier this all gets, the more tedious it all gets. So, hey, Tony, what's happening? Hey, not for you. Not much. Great. All right, so let's consider a case here. Um, consider that you're building a project and at the day you're building, let's say we, we're going to build the whole thing today. As of today, it works with a particular version or a particular range of versions of all the dependencies. So I went and I downloaded whatever version of Swift Miller's out and I went and downloaded whatever version of YAML component is out and I wrote my code to interact with those versions and everything's great and my project's working fine. Um, the problem is there's no guarantees that the next version of either one of those dependencies is still gonna work. There's no guarantee that those APIs aren't gonna change. Um, so we have to you know, be able to keep track of that stuff. So really what we need to do is we need to pin or we need to lock a particular version of our project with our particular version of each of the dependencies, right? So we, we would love for a way to say version 1.0.0 of our project works with version 5.4.12 of this dependency and 1.0.8 of that dependency. And that way, anybody who uses our project, they know that they have to go get those exact versions of those two dependencies and everything will be fine. <clears throat> if they were to go out and get the latest version of those dependencies, who knows? Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Um, the other thing we have to watch out for is if our dependencies 
require dependencies of different versions. So this is a made up case here, but what if Swift Mailer required that polyfill icon v version one and some other dependency required polyfill icon v version two dot something? <coughs> Excuse me. You can assume that um, different major versions of that same dependency probably work very differently. So what do we do? We have two dependencies with very different versions. They're not compatible. We need to know that. So again, if we had a lot of dependencies with a lot of sub dependencies, blah, 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 that would be a very tedious thing to keep track of. All right, so keep on considering the same case. Um, you know, it is possible that the dependency of one of our dependencies can conflict with the dependency of another one of our process dependencies. So there I used, I used the word dependency four times in a sentence. I'm very proud of myself. Um, it's very typical for modern projects, including Drupal, to have many dependencies. Uh, Drupal core alone has 30-ish uh, dependencies. The example I'm showing here is two. So you can see where this gets out of hand really quickly. So summarize, keeping each dependencies version locked as well as checking for version conflicts is challenging, we'll say. Let's say tedious as well. Um, assembling a code base that includes dependencies and dependencies of dependencies and making sure the version numbers are correct, et cetera, that's, that's even more tedium that nobody wants to do. Um, humans aren't, de aren't dependable. That's not a job that we're good at. Um, you know, so credit Ryan Zrama for that quote, which I'm very jealous of. Um, but this is where Composer comes in because these are the problems that Composer solves. We tell Composer that we need a particular range of versions meaning, hey, Composer, we need the you know, version five dot something of that dependency over there. It does everything else. It will go get the latest version of the dependency. It will make sure that that version does not conflict with any other versions, um, with other, other dependencies. It will actually make sure we don't already have it because maybe we already have it because it's a dependency of some other dependency. Um, so it takes care of all of that for us. And you can imagine Drupal core, or 30 dependencies, the dependency tree it gets very deep from there. Um, you know, it, it's a pain. That's not something we want to be doing. So let's kind of go through this process because there's a few more things Composer does that are best shown or best demonstrated um, or best shown while demonstrated, I should say. So what I'm going to do, and let's see, I think I have a slide here. Yeah. So we're gonna use a couple of commands. We're gonna use composer list, which will basically just show us a list of all available composer commands. Um, we'll talk about composer help real quick, which is exactly what you think it is. Uh, we'll talk about composer init. So we're actually gonna create a composer project from scratch. This project's gonna have nothing to do with Drupal, just uh, be warned. Um, then we're gonna use composer require, which is the command we use to add a new dependency to our project. We're going to talk about the auto loader a little bit, and I think that's that's best explained with as part of the example. Um, and then we're going to write a few lines of PHP to use the new dependency and kind of tie everything together. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. All right, so I have. Let's see, do I have? No, I don't. Know. Leave that open. Let me go to my open up my terminal. I'm big in that. And let me get this thing off. That thing should stay out of the way. Get the font size bigger. And clear all that. All right. That's going to be really annoying, but I have to move that. Sorry. That's going to annoy me. That over there. Okay. That's much better. All right. So I'm going to go to my sites directory. And I am going to create a new directory. Oops. MKDIR. Uh, I'm going to call it hairball. All right, and I'm going to cd into that. So this is going to be a project hairball. And obviously it's a new directory, so it's completely empty. There's nothing in there. All right, so let's talk real quick about a couple of those commands. I have Composer installed on in Mac OS. Um, so you can verify if you have it um, installed by using which command if you're on a Linux -y environment. And as long as you get a pass, then that means it's accessible. You can also do composer dash dash version just see the version of Composer that you have installed. And mine is uh, a little over a month old. I'm not even sure if there's an update. Um, probably something I should check, but not for right now. 
Then you can do a composer list. And this works, this is pretty standard for most command line applications. It just shows you a list of all the available commands, which are the things in green. So, you know, there's a few dozen of them for composer. It's not the smallest command set. Um, you know, here's the one we're using right now, composer list. If you want to learn more about a particular command, like we're going to do composer init next, you can do composer init dash dash help. And rather than running the command, it will basically just, let's see, there we go. Here's where I ran the command. It will basically just give you some help text on the command you gave it. All right, so there's a lot here, but the nice thing about the init command is it's interactive as well. So we don't actually need to remember all of these little switches and options, unless you really want to, unless maybe you're gonna script it. Um, we can just start a new project by doing composer init. So basically, it's kind of like when you initialize an empty Git repository, we're initializing a new composer project. And it'll start asking us questions. Okay, so what it's gonna do is it's going to walk us through creating a composer.json file. So a composer.json file is, um, I, I think of it as the manifest. Um, some people call it the recipe for your project. Um, it's basically the list of dependencies gets stored in there. The, depend the direct dependencies, so the dependencies that we say that we want get stored in there along with some metadata, um, and some other stuff, which we probably won't get to uh, tonight. So the end result of this command is going to be a composer.json file. All right, so the first thing we have to do is name our package or name our project. Um, everything in composer is a vendor slash name format. So normally vendor is the name of the organization, name is the name of the project. So maybe for this, and you see the default on my computer is my username followed by the name of the directory. Um, so, I mean, you could do something like, um, you know, we could do Florida Drupal being our vendor and Meetup being our project or something like that. But you always want to have your, your package name, your project name and vendor slash name, usually all lowercase, definitely no spaces, I, you know, just keep it very machine namey, you know, avoid, avoid, you know, special characters, keep it alphanumeric if possible. And, um, and just keep it simple. So I'm actually just gonna accept the default. Michael slash hairball and hit enter. Um, description is where we get to, you know, use, you know, proper English in a sentence. So I'm gonna say, uh, for, I'll say uh, sample, sample project for Florida Drupal virtual meetup. All right, so notice I don't have to put in quotes, just nice and simple. Um, the author of the project. Um, project's gonna have more than one author. By default, it just it grabs me from my user account. So I'm gonna say fine on that. Minimum stability. So let's talk about this one for a minute. When we add a dependency to our project, the minimum stability basically dictates which version of that dependency will be gotten. So the default value is stable, meaning if we don't add anything here, which we're not. We're gonna accept the default, which is empty. Um, when we say, hey, composer, go get me the YAML component dependency, it's going to get us the latest stable release. If we change the minimum stability to beta, and then we say, composer, go get me um, the YAML component, if the latest version is a beta version, it will get that. Um, so this really dictates the stability of the dependencies that are gotten by default. Um, you can override this on a per dependency basis. So it's not the end of the world, whatever you choose it. Um, but stable or the default value is a pretty good, is a pretty good starting point. Um, so I, I, that's what I recommend for the vast majority of projects. Uh, package type. So let's talk about this one for a minute. You can see there's four options. Library, project, meta package, or composer plugin. If you are building an application, um, like a Drupal site, the answer is gonna be project. You're building a composer project. A library is a dependency. Like if you're gonna build a, 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 a dependency or a project that um, is, is meant to be included in other projects, then you would select library. But if you're building a standalone project, 
then um, the answer is going to be a project. Um, a meta package is, I'm not actually 100% sure what a meta package is. I think a meta package is just a library without any actual code. It just defines a set of dependencies. So it's like kind of like a group of dependencies that you can add, um, that you can specify for inclusion in some other project all at once. Um, and then a Composer plugin is exactly what it sounds like. It's code that extends Composer. Maybe it's code that offers the custom command for your project or for some projects. Um, so by far the, the two most you know, commonly used package types are library or project. Um, and if you're building a site, it's going to be project. Oops, sorry. I'm going to hit, um, I'm going to type in project. So you can see the over here, the default value is blank. So you have to give it a value. It doesn't default it to blank. License. Um, again, optional. You can leave it blank. But if you are creating a library that you're going to share on GitHub or somewhere, you should probably assign it an open source license. Um, and you would type that in here. This is a project. Um, you know, it's a throwaway project, so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to enter and leave it blank. So now, as part of Composer Init, we can add, start adding dependencies. Um, I'm actually not going to do this here. That way we can use the Composer require command in, um, in a bit. But if we did know that we needed these five dependencies, we could just start typing them in and do it right here. But um, I'm going to say no, and we're not going to do that here. Um, so now there's this other thing, would you like to define your dev dependency? So notice there's two types of dependencies, require and require dev dependencies. Require dependencies are dependencies that your um, site needs for production. These are kind of like the core dependencies. Dev dependencies are development dependencies, things that you only need during development and not necessarily in your production environment. So examples of this would be like maybe a testing framework. You don't need your testing framework on production. You just need it in your dev environments. So you could add it to your required dev section. Um, and then later on, when you pull into production, you could basically tell Composer, hey, Composer, go get me all of the required dependencies, but skip the required dev dependencies because we don't need those here. So that's all it is. It's just the way they, they behave the exact same way, except you can exclude the required dev dependencies uh, if you desire. So I'm going to type no for that one as well. All right. And then it's basically showing this little preview of our composer JSON file. So all of that, what, 10, 15 minutes of me yapping uh, um, results in these six or seven lines of, um, of uh, JSON. So it's composer.json. So it's obviously uh, JSON, uh, object no uh, JavaScript object notation is what it stands for. We see the name, description, type, authors as an array, so we can add multiple authors if we need to. Um, we left license blank, so that didn't get put in there, and our require section is blank as well. So if this all looks good, then we can hit yes. That's the default value, so I'm just going to hit enter, and we can do an ls-al, and we can see, poof, there's our composer.json, and we can cat that and see the exact same thing. So it saves us a little bit of time um, if you're starting a project from scratch. All right, so far so good? Makes sense? Okay. Linda's nodding her head, so that means we're good. All right. Da, da, da. All right, so let's add, let's start adding a dependency. So how do we know what dependencies we want? Um, so let's go to, um, let's go to GitHub. Right, because we're all familiar with GitHub, and uh, I don't want to see it. the bottom one down there. And you know, this is where you know all a lot, or not all, but an awful lot of open source projects are are um, uh, live and, and are developed. So let's say we we want a YAML, we want some way to read write YAML. So let's just search read write YAML and do a search. And we have 54 repository results. So we have this one, read, write YAML files with as little code as possible, but that's Perl. So we don't, definitely don't want those. So let's go down here and let's look at PHP ones. So we have this one, YAML comments, this one. So there's a few of them there. Um, 
you know, these are okay. None of these are super well used. 127 star, four star, one star. So not really the ones we're looking for. Maybe we'll just, let's just search for YAML this time. And again, let's narrow it down. You can see there's a lot more. So let's go to PHP. And so here's a Symphony YAML. So we've heard of Symphony before, right? That's, and that's got, you know, 2,600 stars. You know, here's one that's 4,500, but this isn't really a YAML, you know, so this one up here, it's a YAML component loads and dumps YAML files. That sounds very promising. Um, here's a deprecated one, ignore that one. This one doesn't really do anything with YAML, which basically just has a list of world countries. You know, service provider for Silex using YAML. So some of these involve YAML, but aren't really what we're looking for. Symphony YAML you know, sounds awfully good. And there's some other ones down here. Um, here's a, a Laravel one, um, library for deserializing data. Uh, you know, so this will get us one direction. Um, I assume that the fact that it has in parentheses means it'll do it in both directions. So this one might be a good one as well. But so you go through and you figure out which, which you know, of these you want to use. Um, I'm going to stick with the Symphony one. I'm a little bit more familiar with Symphony. So if we come here, you know, here's the code. That's all great. But how do we, like, how do we get this? How do we use Composer to get this? Um, well, you know, it might be listed maybe in the documentation we could, we could start poking around for. But while the, the code is housed on GitHub, the place we actually want to go to find, you know, the best way to install it with Composer is a site called packagist.org. So packagist.org is like the old yahoo.com of websites. Um, packagist doesn't have any of the code. It's just a directory of code. Um, it points to a lot of code on GitHub, but also code in GitLab and Bitbucket and maybe even SourceForge and all these other open source kind of repositories around the web. Um, Packages is kind of the, it's actually the default, um, the default repository for Composer. Meaning by default, if you ask Composer for dependency, it's going to ask packages first. So why don't we do this? We found symphony slash YAML and that kind of looks like vendor slash um, name, right? So let's type that into packages, see what we get. And sure enough, it's right there. You can see it's, you know, it's been downloaded 129 million times, which is insanity. Um, and you can actually see, they actually give you the composer command right there to get it. Um, it actually points back to the GitHub page, which is the same URL as this. So it points to where its source is stored. So in this case, it's GitHub. Um, the current version, 434. Um, you know, it actually, you know, so this YAML component requires some stuff. It, there's a dev requirement on it. Um, you can also use Composer to suggest additional um, dependencies. They're kind of like soft requirements. Um, and then over here, you got a list. If I expand this, here's a list of every single version. So you can see there's some betas and RCs and dev versions. And, you know, there's a dev master and stuff like that. But the most recent release version is always an orange, which is this one right here. So once you kind of understand the relationship between packages and GitHub and GitLab and all those, I normally just skip the GitHub set, uh, step. I normally come just right to packages. And if I know, um, like I had to write an integration with uh, um, uh, Communico, uh, which is a event, a, a, an event site used by libraries. Um, you know, unfortunately, not a whole lot of, you know, I didn't really find anything when I looked last time and, you know, but if you look for, uh, blah, blah, um, what, am I, what am I thinking, uh, like, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to use GitHub, that's a little bit meta, um, like Flickr, there's an old school one, um, yeah, here's a Flickr API wrapper. Here's a wrapper to make Flickr calls. So these things are probably a heck of a lot easier than using the Flickr API directly. These are client libraries. So these are probably, they make, they make your job a lot easier. So if you have to do an integration, I mean, Salesforce is another one. There's probably a ton of Salesforce on here, right? 
Yeah. So here's, you know, um, PHP client for Salesforce SOAP API, Laravel library, blah, 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 all kinds of Salesforce. Let's bottom with that one, 5 million. So anyway, this is normally my first stop if I'm looking for a dependency. Um, and, you know, this goes without saying this is a Drupal meetup. So, you know, for Drupal dependency, you're probably going to go to Drupal.org. Um, but for a non-Drupal dependency, you want to go to Packagist. This is really the de facto, like, clearinghouse for dependencies. So, all right, I've talked enough about it. We can see the command, composer require, basically um, use this inside of your project to tell composer that you want this dependency. So let's do that. And again, as a reminder, I'm just doing ls-al. All we have is a composer.json right now. I'm gonna do a composer require symphony slash yaml and hit enter. And depending on your bandwidth, depending on the size of the project, this, you know, this might take a few seconds or it might take a few minutes. But basically it's going out and it's looking at, um, it's calling up to GitHub, seeing what's there. It's downloading some stuff. It's making sure there's no conflicts. Um, in our project, there's not going to be any conflicts because there's no other dependencies. But as soon as this is just about done, okay, okay, so we can see what happened here. Um, so package operations. So it actually installed two dependencies. I'm oh, sorry, my highlighting is terrible. Um, it installed Symphony YAML first. Well, not first, second, actually, version 3.4.3.4. But as we saw on the GitHub page, this component had a dependency on Symphony Polyfill C type. So Composer actually went out and got this one first. So how does Composer know that YAML has a dependency on Polyfill C type? Actually, let me just do it this way. The YAML component has its own composer.json, its own manifest, its own recipe. So this file, which is part of this project, lists the dependencies for this project. And lo, lo and behold, one of the dependencies is polyfill C type. So this kind of, you know, what basically happened here is composer went out, got the latest version of, or looked at the latest version of Symphony YAML and saw, oh, that has a composer.json. Let me see what its dependencies are. In its composer.json, it saw this. So then it looked at this project. And if we look at this project on GitHub, let's go down the rabbit hole a little bit more. There's a composer.json, but the only requirement is a really old version of PHP. So there's no additional kind of software requirements or, or code requirements, I guess I should say, for Symphony polyfill, polyfill type. But Composer did look at this file to verify that there, was, there were no additional requirements that it needed. Um, and then it, you know, it got the latest version for each. In my case, because I've done this before, it didn't have to download them. I had everything cached, so it loaded it from cache. I mentioned the suggestions before, so this is where the suggestion gets um, surfaced. In our case, we don't need it. Then it does two other things. It writes a lock file, and it generated an auto load files. So there's four things that we now have that we didn't have before. We have this dependency, it's polyfill C type. We have this dependency, the one we asked for. We have something called a lock file, and then we have something called auto load files. So let's put our eyes on each of those. All right, so composer.json, that changed a little bit. Right, and our require section is no longer empty. Composer require put our YAML um, requirement in there with um, a range of versions, basically at least 4.3, but it will never go above four unless we specifically change this and tell it to. Um, it also created a composer.lock file, which we're not going to open up because most of the time you don't, you, know, you don't need to look inside it. It is plain text, so you, it's readable. It's all JSON. Um, what the composer.lock file does is it records the exact version of each dependency um, uh, installed. 
So while our composer.json says that our project needs at least this version, composer.lock has the information that says the version that was actually installed was 4.3.4. And it came from here and a bunch of metadata. Um, so this is the recipe, but this is really the blueprint. This is the exact version, all, all of the measurements, all of the exact versions. Um, okay, so that was our lock file. So where are our dependencies? Well, there's only one place they can be inside the vendor directory. So let's do an ls-al in the vendor directory. What do we see? We see uh, three things, autoload.php, which we'll talk about in a minute, composer, which has to do um, with composery stuff. Not really gonna talk about that one. Um, although it's kind of related to autoload.php as well, but it's not super important. But the Symfony one is interesting, because if you recall, both of our dependencies were with, from the vendor Symfony. So the way Composer works is for each vendor, they get a directory inside of your vendor directory. And if we peek, us, peek inside there, there's our two dependencies. And let's peek inside the YAML one, there's our code. So this code right here from in the YAML component, let's go back a couple, is this code right here. And when we, down, when we request a dependency by default, Composer puts all the dependency codes somewhere in the vendor directory, which is good because Composer organizes all that for us. We don't have to worry about it. It's, a, it, it's all in predictable places. Um, all right, so moving on. And we're gonna talk about the auto loader as we kind of do the next step. And the next step is to basically, let's write some code that um, you know, basically utilizes this YAML component. So let's open up a PHP file. So I'm gonna use nano, do everything on the command line. Nano, uh, I'll call it create yaml, oh, yaml.php. All right, so it's gonna be a PHP app, PHP file. So we have to write a little bit of PHP. We have to open up a tag. And basically what do we wanna do? Somehow we have to include the yaml component. So we gotta do that first. That's a code comment. Um, then we're going to uh, set up a PHP array for uh, export to YAML. So we need some type of data that we can export to YAML. Um, so then we're gonna take that and we're gonna convert that to YAML, convert PHP array to YAML. And then the last step is gonna be write YAML to file. So those are the four steps. That's what our, that's what our code is gonna do. So back in the day, pre-composer, let me exit out of this. So pre-composer, if we wanted to utilize some code that we just downloaded, we would have to read some documentation and we, you probably still have to read some documentation, but you have to read documentation specifically to find out what do you need to include? Which file do you need to include to get that functionality? Um, and I'm pretty sure the answer would be this, this yaml.php. So back in the day, we'd have to come here and do maybe something like a require once, um, and then we'd have to go what, up? Let's see, we'd have to go, no, into the vendor directory, into the symphony directory, into the YAML directory, and then include that file, All right? So we'd have to do something like that in order to just you know, get access to the code, just to, to see the code. And then once we did that, because these are all classes, you know, we might have to do something like, you know, uh, you know the YAML uh, component, component equals new YAML. You know, we'd have to like figure out, we'd have to look at this, the documentation, figure out what that class name was and kind of, you know, do all this stuff. Um, this is tedious and it's dependent on this path and dependent on this file location, which is less than ideal. So this is where the auto loader comes in. 
Um, the autoloader basically allows us to just tell PHP the namespace of the dependency, and it will take care of everything else. So again, I'm going to exit out of this. So it's again, you have to like read a little bit of documentation, but it's actually not that bad. So if we come here to symphony.yaml, um, you know, I'm going to click on documentation. And it's very good documentation here. It's why I picked this one. But if you know, I usually look for the simplest use case and scroll down and you know, here we go. This is actually, you know, just about all we need. So this is a use statement and this is not exactly a path. It looks like a path because it has slashes, but this is actually a namespace. Symphony slash component slash YAML slash YAML. So where does this even come from? Let's look at that real quick. This is kind of PHP object oriented stuff. Um, but if we look at this one, just because I know the answer, it defines what its namespace is. So this class, which is YAML, lives in this namespace. Symphony slash component slash YAML is a namespace with another YAML as the class. So therefore the namespace or the, the use statement, where did it go? The use statement is symphony slash component slash YAML and then the class is YAML. So with just a little bit of reading the documentation, we can do this. And this gets us part of the way there, but it doesn't get us the whole way there. Because as of this moment in time, this is the first line, you know, PHP doesn't know anything about this. It doesn't, you know, it says use namespace. I've never seen that namespace before in my life. So we have to do something here. There has to be something here that, you know, kind of gives PHP access to all those namespaces. And that's what the autoloader does. That's what Composer autoloader basically allows us to use these use statements because it knows where all of our dependencies are. When we installed, when we did a composer require, composer was responsible for going out, getting the code, putting it in a specific location. As soon as it did that, it wrote the auto loader. And all the lo auto loader is, well, in its simplest form, it's a lookup table. You basically say, symphony, uh, you know, you basically tell PHP the namespace you want to use. And, and we're about to add a little bit of code here, but that code basically allows PHP to look up this namespace in our vendor directory. It's just, it's, it's like, it's an address book is all it really is in its simplest form. So in order to, uh -oh, what happened? Oh, I don't want to write that. Well, I guess I am writing that. Okay. So if we actually here, while I'm here, let's take a peek. If we do an ls-al vendor, we see this auto load.php. Um, I mean, let's go ahead. We'll cat it out real quick. I don't normally do this, but um, okay. So yeah, so that, you know, all this does, you know, it's, an, it's a generated by composer. It requires something else. It returns this function. And this function basically has, it's a map of, um, of namespaces to paths in our vendor directory. So all we need to do is include the autoloader. We basically need to include this file in our application in order to get access to that directory. So we are going to require once vendor slash auto load dot PHP. So this is basically the object directory so to speak. And once we require that, then these use statements will all work because the auto loader knows about this and knows exactly where this is in the vendor directory. So it's a little bit of a black box in composer, which is fine. Here's the really cool part though. If you look at, um, a standard Drupal 8 install. I'll make this bigger in a second. If you go to the index.php file and just, yeah, this is a standard Drupal 8 install. So index.php is the page that all, you know, all requests go through.
That should look familiar. Drupal Core does the exact same thing. It's requiring an auto loader. And this is an auto loader. It's a little bit more complex. It's, it's composer generated. It's a little more complex than the one we have because we have one dependency and Drupal Core has got a whole boatload. But it's the exact same concept. No difference at all. Require this lookup for all of these use statements. Um, where my oh there it is okay all right so we've basically done all the hard work at this point we've added a dependency we now have access to the dependency in a lazy way meaning that PHP code will not be loaded in memory unless it's needed so if we added thirteen dependencies but we only use one of them we only use one of their namespaces the other thirteen do not get parsed by PHP. PHP, which is a, obviously a good thing. All right, so let me just very quickly, I'm just gonna copy and paste a little, little PHP array in here. So this is gonna be our little test array. It's a multi-dimensional array. And basically the goal of here is we're gonna take this array and we're gonna write it out to a YAML file in YAML. Um, so again, we could go to documentation and actually here it is right here. Um, it's a singleton. So we can, you know, that's the, the YAML object. This is, you know, this comes from here. And this object has a parse method. And, um, you know, it basically looks like that we, you know, you pass it, you pass it some, uh, actually this is going the other way. This is going um, from YAML to uh, an object. So we actually need to go the other way, which is uh, the dump command. So again, YAML equals, we're gonna, it looks gonna look the same way. So we wanna dump this array. So we're passing it this array, we're passing it to the YAML component, the dump method, and you know, we could go to GitHub and sell GitHub open. What's this? YAML, yeah, okay, so I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm positive. There's gonna be a, oh wait, there's parse, so maybe dump is not far behind. Yeah, here's the, here's the dump method. And this creates this new object, which then it calls. So we can we can dive into this if we want to. But this is the method we're going to call. So that takes an array and it prints it out as YAML, or it saves it in a variable as YAML. So then the last thing we have to do is we have to actually write a um, use a little uh, PHP function file put contents, and that takes basically a name of a file and what we wanna stick in that file, which is our YAML. And that's it, that's our whole application. Um, you know, we basically took an array, we converted it to YAML and we wrote it out to a, to a file and assuming I didn't make any mistakes in my um, syntax, we should just be able to go, you know, run that using the PHP uh, executable Nothing horrible happened, it looks like. So we should have a new hairball file. We do have a hairball.yaml file. And if we cat that out, sure enough, we have our array in YAML syntax. All right, so short version. We, you know, we use Composer to get the dependency. That was you know, the, the first big step. And the second big step is all about utilizing that dependency. It's all about, you know, understanding that we need the auto loader in order to, you know, provide a, like a directory lookup for all of our dependencies. Make sense so far? Well, forget about so far. That's, that's literally as far as I was going to go. <laughs> um, you know, there's other commonly used commands. Well, here, let me, let me do this. I will show this. Um, so this was a very non-Drupal example. So most folks, if you're building a Drupal 8 site, you're using this thing, which is this, you know, this template. So wh why do we need, like, what's the point of this template? Why can't we just sit down and, you know, do exactly what did Composer and Knit, and then do Composer require Drupal slash core? Why can't we just do that? 
Well, let's investigate that just for a minute. Then we might get a new appreciation for what this thing actually does. Let's go to um, back to packages. And let's search for Drupal slash core or just Drupal core. So there's this one, um, which, you know, looks pretty good. And this is actually, you know, this is our Drupal core 877. It's actually mirrored on GitHub, um, 7 million installs, blah, blah, blah. And look at all these dependencies, a lot of dependencies there. But based on what I just showed you, if I do this, where does Drupal core end up? It ends up in the vendor directory, right? And I don't want to do it because this one takes a few minutes because it's big. Um, but we'll end up with a Drupal directory in the vendor directory and then a core directory in there and then Drupal core inside of there. And then what if I add um, another requirement on path auto module? Where does that go? That also goes in vendor slash Drupal, but now in slash path auto. Well, that's not right because that needs to go in like a, you know, in a module slash contrib directory. Um, what if I download a theme? That's going to end up again in the vendor directory. So problem number one is if we just start adding these Drupal requirements, everything's going to end up in the vendor directory and nothing's going to be in the right place. Um, luckily, we can fix that. You know, there is actually a, um, a dependency out there called composer installers where you can specify, hey, composer, if someone asks for a dependency of type Drupal module, then put it in this directory over here instead of in the vendor directory. So you can start customizing where your dependencies end up. And that's great. We can do that. We can, you know, composer require. And if we come over to here, we can find that. It's called composer, composer stuff. Installers. So we can do this and, you know, um, we can, you know, read about this one and install it and configure it and do all that good stuff. And that solves one problem. That solves the problem of putting stuff in the right place. Uh, problem number two is Drupal core only includes this directory, the core directory. Well, what about all this other stuff? Update.php, robots.txt, index.php. I mean, those seem pretty important. You, you kind of need those. Well, again, we could write a composer plugin if we wanted to that went out and downloaded all of these scaffold files. These are called scaffolding files. So we could write a plugin, Composer plugin, that went out, downloaded all those scaffolding files, put them in the right place. Okay, so we could do that. That's another problem solved. Um, and that would take time, and then we could reuse that over and over again. Um, we could do that, but that's what this is. Drupal Composer Drupal Project Template is exactly that and more. It basically has all the stuff included in it that we need to stand up a Drupal site. So if we look at its composer.json, and it has a bunch more, but it, it uses Composer installers. And down here, you know, here's all the configuration that it needs. You know, when Composer, when you require a dependency of type Drupal theme, it puts it in web slash theme slash contrib slash whatever the name of the theme is. When you download a dependency of type Drupal core, it ends up in web slash core. So that's all done for us. Those scaffolding files, those are all done via a script. That has been written for us. So we don't have to do that. And there's a bunch of other things in this template that are good to do for a base Drupal 8 installation that we don't need to worry about. So that's the whole point of this template is it does a bunch of stuff that we would have to do if we started from scratch, but it kind of gives us a head start. And in addition, it gives us, you know, Drupal console, it gives us Drush, it gives us the most awesome composer patches, um, a dependency, which I'm not gonna talk about, but if you use this template, you should definitely make sure you know what that is. Um, yeah, so it does a bunch of stuff. So let me, I'll finish up by saying that currently as of today, this is 
uh, the, the, the de facto best practice for standing up a Drupal 8 site. However, that's going to change in the next few months. No, no, it's okay though. Drupal, let's see, composer support. Because there's an initiative going on, composer support and core initiative. So notice that this is, you know, this is not on Drupal.org, this is hosted on GitHub. You know, these scripts and stuff are all hosted on GitHub. These are community supported right now, but they're not official, and I'm making air quotes. Um, this initiative, its goal is to take all of this stuff, the scripts, um, and, and, and um, harden them, make them, make them more flexible, and make them part of Drupal core so that they become official. Um, and the work is actually really, really far along. Um, I know I did a podcast with um, one of the um, initiative leads, and I'm pretty sure Mike Herschel and DrupalEyes.me folks did a podcast with them as well um, that talks all about, you know, what the, you know, the movement from this to the official version, which is going to be very, very similar. Um, and support for this is not going to go away. So if you started a project on this, you probably don't have to worry about it for a long, long time. But if you're going to start a new project after the new year, you might want to pay particular attention to, you know, what's going on with this. Um, I can tell you some, some stuff is already in core. It's not being used. It's not really surfaced all that well, but a lot of foundation has already been committed to core um, so that we have an official version of this template. All right, I think that's where I'm gonna stop. Questions? No? Fantastic, Tony? No, I'm good. Are you sure? Oh yeah. 100%? <laughs> yeah, where's the computer at? Let's log on. All right. All right, well, I'm gonna wrap things up then. Um, I'm gonna wrap, wrap up the recording. And um, this will be available online. Uh, I forget where. Is it Drupal.tv? Is that where these things go? Or just on? Uh, I should probably know where they end up. Yeah, somewhere on YouTube. And then somewhere on groups.drupal.org. Drup groups so anyway, uh, thanks, everyone. And that is it. So I'm going to stop the share and stop the recording. Have a good evening. All right. Yes, I want to stop.